Good morning and Happy Easter. Welcome to our Sunday devotional for Easter Resurrection Sunday, <clears throat> April 17th, 2022. Our silent meditation for today it comes from Phillips Brooks, who writes this, Let every man and woman count himself immortal. Let them catch the revelation of Jesus in his resurrection. Let them say not merely, Christ is risen, but also, I shall rise. Amen to that. Friends, early on the first day of the week, the disciples of Jesus went to the tomb where he had been buried, only to find that the stone had been rolled away and the tomb was empty. We gather here as Christ's disciples on this first day of the week to celebrate the good news of the gospel. Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. Amen. <clears throat> For announcements this morning, let's see at St. Paul's, not only is this Easter Sunday, but also Confirmation Sunday. We have two confirmands this year that we'll be confirming during the service in the church. Um, today is also a Communion Sunday, so if you haven't prepared your elements, bread or cracker, wine, grape juice, fruit juice, take a moment to do that. We'll be right here. <clears throat> and something to look forward to for next week. We have been talking more at Salem, but now starting also at St. Paul's, about the idea of God winks. Stories that someone might call a coincidence, but you don't have to look very deeply to realize God was at work there. So we call them Godwink stories. And next week, we will have one of our members from Salem, Jack Damon, share that message, um, sharing some stories in his life about Godwinks. He'll be doing that at both churches. Uh, we'll be recording it which means that the service that's posted in the morning won't have his message. It'll have the rest of the service, but then we'll post his message later on in the day. Something to look forward to. Let us continue now with our service. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. Our profession of faith this morning comes from words written by St. Paul's confirmands. Whenever we have a confirmation class, I encourage the young people to write what we call a personal statement of faith. What is it that they now understand and believe, something that they can own for themselves? <clears throat> and then we work that in combining words from each of them, work that into a profession of faith. So let us join in expressing our faith using their words. I believe that God is our Lord and Savior. He guides us and shows us the way. He is our light and our hope. The more I learn about God, the more connected I feel to him. I believe that the Bible is like a textbook that helps us learn more about God and Jesus. I believe that church isn't just a place for worship. It is a place where we go more in-depth with God than we would if we were just sitting at home on a couch. I believe that sin isn't just a little mess up here and there. Sin is betraying what God has told us to do. But we are forgiven because Jesus died on the cross for us. I believe that God offers us the fountain of life and that in God's light we see light. He will guide me to where he wants me, the path he has chosen for me. I believe that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, and that he forgives us our sins. Wonderful, wise words. Join me now in the spirit of prayer. God of creation, creating anew, the silence is broken. With the women in the garden, we catch our breath, 
wipe our tears, and try to describe our experience with you. But what words can describe shadows fleeing from the tomb? How can we explain to people about the morning when the world was turned upside down? No mortal words will do. Still we must spread the news. Christ is risen. Our knees are weak from running. Our voices tremble on the edge of fearful joy. Our eyes have seen the glory of the Lord shining upon the world. May every breath we take, every word we utter, everything we do, witness to the truth of Christ's resurrection. Amen. We come next to our children's time, so I would encourage you to gather the young people around the device if they're not already there. And we have a picture that you have to look carefully at. First, of course, you see the little boy, and he's smiling. He looks surprised. But then look at the other main person there. It's a man in a military uniform. And if we look carefully, we realize he has just popped out of a box. Now, I know he's got his arms out, but if you look carefully, he's smiling. It might look at first like he's trying to scare the little boy, but no, he's smiling. And I bet you know this story. Maybe you've seen it on TV. Maybe you have lived it. A father or a mom returning from military service, surprising their child. And that's exactly what's going on here. The little boy had no idea that his dad was coming home right then and there. And his dad made a big surprise out of it, as you can see, popping out of that box. The dad, of course, is happy to see his son. The son is thrilled to see his dad again. This is kind of like what happened at Easter. We remember from the past few weeks where we've been following the story of Jesus, He'd been very popular on Palm Sunday, and then the people turned against him. And on Good Friday, they killed him on a cross. But the good news of Easter is he didn't stay dead. He rose again on Easter Sunday. And when his friends, who thought for sure he was dead and gone and they didn't know what they were going to do next, when his friends suddenly saw him alive again, well, just like that little boy in the picture, they were so thrilled and happy, surprised, amazed. I hope when you think about Jesus, you can have just that same smile and amazement. Because he is there for us. He's risen again. He'll never die again. And he's always with us in his spirit. So we can be excited that Jesus rose again. Amen. At our churches, we decorate with flowers, a variety of different flowers. People donate and order different flowers, and they make the sanctuary look so pretty, and smells nice too. So what I would like to do now, and I, and I bet you may have some Easter flowers in your home too, you may have some sitting right there. Maybe they'll be on your dinner table for Easter lunch. Let's just spend a few moments talking about those flowers. The lily. Before fully opening, lilies assume a trumpet shape. This shape represents God the Father calling his son Jesus home, which is a great source of joy for Christians. The choice of white lilies indicates purity and freedom from sin through Jesus' death on the cross. Legend holds that lilies grew wherever Jesus' tears fell, offering hope to believers. The hyacinth. In medieval artwork, hyacinth symbolized prudence and peace of mind. So in the context of Easter, we can say that those who prudently put their trust in the resurrection can enjoy the peace of mind of knowing that Jesus' promises do come true. 
the tulip. The very regal tulip is significant during Easter as a symbol of the love Jesus gave to the world. Its cup-shaped blossoms also symbolize rebirth, as they are among the first flowers to provide the colors of new spring. The Daffodil The belief in eternal life is symbolized by the daffodil, or narcissus, another flower that blooms in early spring during the Easter season. And as a matter of fact, we have some blooming right now outside the parsonage, both the regular daffodils and the delicate miniature daffodils. Daffodils are perennials, flowers that return each year, and Christian legend holds that daffodils bloomed profusely during the time of Christ's resurrection. And the hydrangea. In flower language, hydrangeas can symbolize many things, including heartfelt emotion and gratitude. We can imagine Jesus' disciples' heartfelt emotion when they thought he was gone forever, <clears throat> and then their gratitude when they saw him alive again. Now please join me in the spirit of prayer as we ask God's blessings on the flowers, the flowers of Easter, flowers that are, are in our sanctuary, and the flowers in your home. Lord, we ask your blessing on all these flowers, given in honor of our living loved ones and in memory of our loved ones who have gone to be with you. Risen Jesus, you once declared that even Solomon in all his glory was not adorned as the flowers of the field. <clears throat> well, this day, we dedicate these flowers to your glory, honoring our loved ones and remembering those who have joined you. The beautiful flowers adorn our sanctuary and our homes, lifting up praise to you, our Creator, by their sheer beauty and fragrance. Now may these visible signs of spring remind us of our new life in Christ. May their beauty be for us a foretaste of the glory that awaits all of us. And just as their fragrance rises into the air, may our prayers of gratitude and joy rise to you, risen one and savior amen let us continue in prayer joining together in the words jesus taught us our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. We come next to our reading of Scripture. And we hear first from Psalm 118, verses 1 and 2, and then verses 14 through 24. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, His steadfast love endures forever. The Lord is my strength and my might. He has become my salvation. There are glad songs of victory in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live, and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has punished me severely, but he did not give me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Our next reading comes from the New Testament, the book of Acts, Chapter 10, 
beginning with verse 34. And here, Peter has been coming to terms with the reality that the gospel is for all people. And so he says to this group, Peter began to speak to them, I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John announced, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses, and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. And we turn next to our gospel, Luke, chapter 24, beginning with verse 1. <clears throat> but on the first day of the week, at early dawn, the women came to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified and on the third day rise again. Then they remembered his words and returning from the tomb they told all this to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told this to the apostles. <laughs> but these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen clothes by themselves. Then he went home, amazed at what had happened. Here end our readings for this Easter day. Our message is entitled, He's as good as his word. Please join me first for a moment of prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our risen Redeemer. Amen. You know, we use words to make lots of promises throughout our lives. <laughs> I promise to clean up my room today. I promise to have the car home by 10 p.m. I promise to pay back my student loans in full and on time. I promise to make my car payments every month till death do us part. Promises that we make. Even here in church, we make promises. I promise to raise my child in a Christian home and teach them about God and Jesus. I promise to serve on consistory with God's help. Or today, I mentioned confirmation at St. Paul's. I promise to love and serve God and Jesus Christ. Yes. Yes, we make lots of promises along the way. And to the best of our ability, we try to live out and fulfill those promises. Sure, sometimes things happen. 
But at least when we are making the promises, we have every intention of fulfilling them. And sure, we all know people who break promises. But when we make a promise, we try very hard to be as good as our word. Well, friends, our Lord Jesus Christ was indeed as good as his word. <laughs> but for some odd reason, his disciples still didn't get it. At least not at first. Consider the number of times Jesus predicted his own death and even warned his followers about it. The Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke record at least three times when he told them this. John's Gospel records at least three other times. So you would think that his followers would get the point. But the only time anyone seems to have taken Jesus seriously about this is when Simon Peter called him out on it. And then Jesus had to rebuke him and explain that Peter was seeing things from a human point of view, whereas God had other plans. Sadly, Jesus was indeed as good as his word about his suffering and death. Just as he said it would, the religious leaders arrested him, had him tortured, and then crucified on Good Friday. Jesus was as good as his word about this, even if his followers remained clueless until it happened. But now what about the other part of the story, where Jesus promised he would rise from the dead? Well, again, wherever Jesus predicts his upcoming death, he also promises that he will rise again. Now, if the disciples remain mostly clueless about Jesus' predictions of his death, well, they were totally clueless about all this rising from the dead stuff. At least death they can understand, but resurrection? That is why every follower of Jesus, starting with the women at the tomb, then Mary Magdalene, then Simon, Peter, and John, and then everyone else, every one of them was mystified when on that first Easter Sunday, they found an empty tomb. After all, dead is dead. They had witnessed that. They finally got it that Jesus was as good as his word about the whole suffering and dying thing. But dead people don't leave their tombs. And yet, the grave cloths that were used to wrap Jesus' body, which were so infused with incense and ointment that they would have stuck to Jesus' body almost like flypaper, well, they find these grave cloths neatly folded up inside the tomb. Now, if somebody had robbed the grave, a grave robber would not have bothered to do that, to take the grave cloths off. They would have just taken the body as it was. And again, dead people can't uncover themselves. Well, for us, the conclusion was obvious. Jesus had indeed risen from the dead. But for those first believers, somehow they still didn't get it. It wasn't until Jesus revealed himself to Mary in the garden, and later, when he appeared to the disciples in the locked upper room, that they finally got it. Jesus had indeed come back from the dead, and he was indeed as good as his word. Friends, this is the core of our faith. We believe that Jesus rose from the dead, just as he said he would. In doing that, he proved he wasn't a madman, but he actually was, and he had hinted at this all along, he was God in human form. Everything hinges on this. If we believe Jesus rose from the dead, then everything else he said and did falls into place. But if we don't believe this central tenet of our faith, frankly, nothing else makes sense. And, in fact, nothing else would really matter. But we, we have been given faith to believe. And when we believe in Jesus' resurrection, we can then believe, trust in everything else. 
If Jesus was as good as his word about rising from the dead, then he is also as good as his word about forgiving our sins. He is as good as his word about going to prepare a place for each of us when it comes our turn to die and enter the life to come. He is as good as his word about the promises awaiting us in paradise, eternal life with him and God, and with our loved ones who also trusted in him. Whatever doubts that the world may throw at us, whatever struggles we may face, whatever uncertainties we may wrestle with, let us hold fast to this one thing. Jesus is always as good as his word. On this Easter Sunday, let us take Jesus at his word, believe the good news of his resurrection, and celebrate the coming promise of our own resurrection. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia and Amen. We belong to Christ Jesus. All things are his, for he is Lord of all. In gratitude for the resurrection life promised to each of us, we now dedicate a portion of the Lord's blessings. And let us join in saying together the offertory response. Praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. We praise you, O God, and give you thanks that you have given us such joy, such grace, such hope in the resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord. May our gifts and our lives be proof of that good news. Amen. As I mentioned, this is also a service of Holy Communion, and we come to that now. Luke the Evangelist records that on the evening of the first day of the week, the same day on which our Lord rose from the dead, when he was at table with two of the disciples. And there's Dave. Hi, Dave. When he was at table with two of the disciples, he took bread and blessed it and broke it. And he gave it to them. And their eyes were opened. And they knew him. Beloved, this is the joyful feast for the people of God, come from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south, and gather about the table of the Lord. Behold, how good and pleasant it is when people dwell in unity. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Now lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is meet and right to do so. We give thanks to you, O Holy Lord, Almighty and everlasting God, for the universe which you have created, for the heavens and the earth, and for every living thing. We thank you that you have formed us in your own image and made us for yourself. We believe you that when... Excuse me. We bless you, that when we rebelled against you, you didn't forsake us, but instead you delivered us from bondage. You revealed your righteous will and steadfast love by the law and the prophets. Above all, we thank you for the gift of your Son, the Redeemer of all people, who was born of Mary, lived on earth in obedience to you, died on the cross for our sins, and rose from the dead in victory who rules over us, Lord above all, prays for us continually, and will come again in triumph. We thank you for your Holy Spirit and for your Holy Church, for the means of grace and for the promise of eternal life. With patriarchs and prophets, apostles and martyrs, with your church on earth and with all the company of heaven, we magnify you and praise you, we worship and adore you, 
O Lord most holy, as we say together, Holy, 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 Lord God of Sabaoth, heaven and earth are full, are full of the majesty of your glory. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. We thank you that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Friends, let us now take and eat the body of Christ, broken for us. Toward the end of the meal, he took the cup, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. Friends, let us take and drink the blood of Christ, pour it out to bring us new and everlasting life. Obeying the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, we, your people, recall his incarnate life, his atoning death, his resurrection and ascension until he comes. Bless and sanctify by your Spirit both us and these, your gifts of bread and wine, which we have received, that in the holy communion of the body and blood of Christ we may be made one with him and he with us and that we may remain faithful members of his body until we feast with him in your heavenly kingdom. For those of you watching from home, I would ask you again to gather your young people around the device for a blessing. And when they're there, please gently place your hand on their shoulders or on their head and join me in the spirit of prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, our risen Savior, may you also rise in the hearts of these young people. May they know for certain that you are alive, that you are there for them, and that you call them to yourself. May the gift of faith be given to each of them, that they would know you and get to know you even better. Amen. And let's join in our prayer of thanksgiving. Holy, gracious God, here at this table your promise of life is made tangible. We have rested in the depth of your love. We have tasted your nourishing, nurturing presence. We welcome you into our lives. Together at this table, you have offered us life. Together by your grace, we welcome the life you offer and accept it. And we give you thanks. Amen. Now, ordinarily, the next thing in the service would be a commission and a benediction. But where a church has a cemetery nearby, I mean like walkable, there is a tradition that we walk over to the cemetery, assuming the weather permits, as a reminder that this is not where things end. This is where life conquers death, where, as Paul says, the imperishable subsumes the perishable, and where our memories are consoled by the hope that is to come. So I would invite you at home, to picture in your mind a cemetery that you are familiar with, maybe one nearby, 
Maybe one far away, but where some of your loved ones are. Or where they were buried, I should say. And let us continue with our procession to the cemetery. Remember this day and every day, Christ is risen. Alleluia. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Quoting Paul here. Listen, I'm telling you a secret. All of us won't die, but we will all be changed. In an instant, in the blink of an eye, at the final trumpet. The trumpet will blast, and the dead will be raised with bodies that won't decay, and we will be changed. It's necessary for this rotting body to be clothed with what can't decay, and for the body that is dying to be clothed in what can't die. And when the rotting body has been clothed in what can't decay, and the dying body has been clothed in what can't die, then this statement in Scripture will happen. Death has been swallowed up by a victory. Where is your victory, death? Where is your sting, death? Death's sting is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. As a result of this, my beloved brothers and sisters, you must stand firm unshakable, excelling in the work of the Lord as always, because you know that your labor isn't going to be for nothing when it is done in the Lord. Sisters and brothers in Christ, let us then be solid in our faith, always doing the work of God and the kingdom, since we have been given such wonderful and joyous promises of hope and new life through our resurrected Savior. So go now. Go as those who have met with Christ in the morning of this day. Go as those whose hearts have burned within them as the scriptures were explained. Go as those who have been touched by resurrection. And as you leave this place, may the blessing of God be upon you, body, mind, and spirit. Amen.